and I'm very grateful for the trust that you've put in me and, and probably not um, the least bit um, contributing to this sense of reflection is working through First Timothy also and uh, what God describes as healthy leadership and um, I am so grateful that uh, you have um, entrusted yourself to my teaching uh, that um, we, we are nourished together and I'm so thankful for that. So thanks for um, opening your ears and hearts together every Sunday and um, look forward to this week and we're going to look together at First Timothy chapter 4 and one of the challenges of preaching and teaching First Timothy is that the book itself was written to church leaders. So one of the challenges is how do you teach a book written to leaders, to people who aren't necessarily um, elders, pastors, deacons um, among the church family. So um, I think it's possible that it would help uh, if you think of it this way. Perhaps what you're hearing in some of these messages is this. What should we be looking for in healthy leadership? Uh, what should we be um, intolerant of? What should we together not tolerate? What should we be prayerful for? And what, where can we um, kind of be on alert for some uh, unhealthy aspects of church leadership? And I'm hoping that in some ways um, God is building in you a vision for what healthy church leadership looks like. And um, I recognize that sometimes when the message isn't like, oh, this is really hitting me where I am in my life and there's a little bit of therapy to it along with some truth and that it's sometimes hard to engage with. But I pray that the Spirit gives you ears to hear and some hearts that are uh, able to learn and grow together. And by the way, if it's in the Scripture, then it's to be taught to the body, right? I mean, you don't come to parts of the Scripture and say, well, we don't need to learn this because this is obviously for somebody else. So... Um, we, we don't want to do that also. A lot of the tension among modern churches is the same tension that's been in all, all churches for all time, is, and, and that is that there is a, oftentimes a tension that is built through unhealthy leaders uh, and their interaction with an unhealthy family, church family. And that eventually kind of discover over time that churches get stuck. Leaders get stuck and churches get stuck. And they get stuck in what can be kind of visualized as quicksand, sinking in quicksand. Churches are sinking, the leaders are sinking, and sometimes it's easy to diagnose. When, when a church treasures traditions over Jesus, then there's the church is going to be stuck. When a church chases fads, trendy, popular fads over church health, the church will get stuck and will sink, slowly sink into quicksand. And when the preacher is preaching personal preferences over essentials of the gospel, the church gets sick and stuck. And so a church would need a transformation plan. And um, as you can imagine, much like you see on social media where every person that is a life coach and a health coach and a business coach, they're offering a transformation plan. All you got to do is sign up and pay for the basics and then work your way through whatever the plan is, and then you can expect transformation in your life, your health, and your business. Um, it's not quite so blatant or um, easy to do that for a whole church. What is the transformation plan that God provides for us? Does every church that's stuck just need a new vision and a new strategy? Does every church that's stuck just need a better, more um, active social media presence? Does a church that's stuck need um, better and new music? Do they need a new building? Um, some people would say you just pray and you pray and pray for a revival. And of course, all those things sometimes help a church kind of nudge forward. But what is God's design for his church family 
to be transformed. What is the transformation plan that God provides? You will not be surprised he provides that in 1 Timothy. He basically says, I'm going to be changing those gospel churches in Ephesus, and here's what I want it to look like. And here's what we're going to see together. The big idea is this. God uses transformed leaders to transform churches. When there is a change in the leadership, I mean, I wonder, have you discovered that sometimes a family change when the parents change? Sometimes the whole household is affected by growth in the marriage, right? If there's marriage in the head, you'll see, or marriage in the head. If there is health in the head, you'll see health in the body. And what God is going to describe in 1 Timothy is that um, I'm going to bring some transformation to my churches and I'm going to start with transformation of the leadership. And what he describes is this. This is what we're going to look at. There's, there's three aspects of this transformation plan, three aspects of transforming leaders. Number one is the leader is nourished by the good news. And secondly, the leader is training hard. And third, the leader is modeling progress. So there's the three. Very simple, he lays this out in chapter 4. Uh, he starts by saying this, the church transformation play, plan from God in the scriptures, the New Testament letter written to the church at Ephesus, he says, church leaders who are nourished by good news. Now, this could be seen as um, a little bit, um, the good news, right? Like, what does that mean? Positive thinking, nourished by, um, you know, a good philosophy, Actually, this, this here, good news, if, you, if you've been with us for a while, you probably, I hope, I hope you recognize this phrase, good news, the gospel. It's good news. The main message of the New Testament church is a good news message. And only recently have I discovered that God has designed our bodies to function on three main um, nutrients. Only recently. Did you know that you can get a multivitamin, and in the multivitamin is dozens and dozens and dozens of micronutrients. If you're a nutritionist, please forgive me for what I'm about to blunder, the way I'm going to butcher this. This, this always happens. I, I want to stay, I should stay in my lane. I'm going to generalize. Essentially, I discover in my adult life that God has made us function on three macronutrients. Some of you know what they are, right? Protein, fat, and Thank God for carbs and carbs. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. And if you focus on those three macronutrients, you can get healthy without having to memorize and multivitamin and get all the micronutrients, although, of course, that's helpful. It's our bodies are made for those kinds of micronutrients. Um, uh, but essentially, there's three big ones, three major ones, three macros that bring the body to health in the right combination. So, as you can imagine, God has also provided macronutrients for a church family. Major essentials that have to be in place for the health to be cultivated. And the transformed church leader is deeply rooted in one of those macronutrients. And that is deeply rooted in the message, the hope, and the good news message that Jesus brought to bear. Rooted and nourished. So, what does that mean, good news doctrines? Well, this is what Paul is saying. When he says good news, Paul is actually saying this. He's saying, the law that you grew up listening and learning to basically said this, to be right with God, you have to follow the rules. Follow the rules. And there's lots of them. It's going to take you the rest of your life to learn them. It's going to be even more difficult, uh, in fact, impossible to follow them all. That's the old message that was protected by the religious people who were in power, and they said there's a lot of laws. I mean, God wrote some and we wrote some, but these are all going to help us get right with God. And essentially, Jesus comes along and says, I am fulfilling those. I am completing those. I am actually achieving all of that. And if you want to be made right with God, then you 
no longer have to follow all those rules. You have to trust, you have to place your faith in me that I followed all those rules on your behalf, right? So it's a new message of faith. So now you can imagine if you're, keeper, if you're the keeper of those rules and somebody says, um, you, don't, you don't have a job anymore. You don't have to protect these rules and so on. So, so here's what Jesus says. We are no longer made right with God by following the rules. We are made right with God by rooting your trust in me. Faith alone in Christ alone. That's good news. That's good news. Why? Because the law kills. Because we all fall short of God's glory. We all fail to fill, um, fill out and finish these laws. So, this also means that church leaders are not rooted in bad news. If Paul takes the time, he's going to show us this, um, to say the leader has to be nourished by good news, he also is saying that the leader has to be careful not to be rooted in bad news. Well, what's the bad news that a, rooter could, uh, a leader could be rooted in? Here's one, be afraid. Be afraid, God will judge you, and if he doesn't, everybody else will. That's bad news, be afraid. God is going to judge you. And maybe he's not, but look around because they are. They're judging you. Another bit of bad news that a church leader could be rooting themselves in. Be ashamed. You're not holy enough to please God. More bad news a leader could be nourished and rooted in. Be angry. Evil is winning. All of those bad news. But here's what we see. Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith. Not the message of works, not the message of performance, not the, me me uh, uh, the message of rule following and law. And the good teaching that you have followed. So nourished means ongoing sustenance. In an ongoing way, uh, Timothy you're going to be continually feeding on the truths of the gospel to stay spiritually healthy and effective. The gospel isn't just, and this is so important for us to see, when I talk about gospel-centered church and teaching and preaching, here's what I don't mean. I don't mean that every single message is Jesus died to take away your sins. Is that an aspect of the gospel? For sure. But I don't mean just simply that. That's the gospel. Jesus died to take away your sins or take away the penalty of your sins. Um, I think of it this way. I mean, Tim Keller, he, he describes this metaphor. He says, the gospel, really, the gospel is like a diamond. And the idea of this is that the gospel is like a diamond. Every time you turn it, you see another aspect of its beauty. You just keep turning the gospel diamond, and you keep turning it, and you see another aspect, and another aspect, and another aspect, and another aspect of this beauty. And it begs the question, why is nourished by a message of faith so crucial? And here's, here's why. Because every church leader is nourishing themselves on something. Every church leader is feeding on something. And um, I heard this statement so long ago. I was a teenager. I heard this um, stuck with me forever, which is this. What you feed grows and what you starve dies. And if you're feeding yourself on the good news, your joy is going to grow. And the temptation is to feed on a performance and a perfection message, right? And then by doing so, feeding your pride, which kills. I can do it. That's what the pride says. Pride says, I can do it. Aren't you impressed? And feeding on your fear kills, which is this, I can't do enough. So imagine a leader who's feeding on pride, which is I can do it, and, I, I, and aren't you impressed? God, aren't you impressed? The church family, aren't you impressed? Public, aren't you impressed? Just feeding my pride. And then uh, another, another way to be rooted in feeding on something that kills is feeding your fear. I can't do enough. I can never do enough. Aren't you mad? God, I know you're mad at me. Church family, I know you're mad. I can't do enough. And it just continues to fear, feed fear, pride, fear. So, um, when you think about church pastors, teachers, 
church leaders. When you think about church pastors, teachers, leaders, and elders, they are to immerse themselves, continuously nourishing themselves on theological macronutrients. And regularly, and this is critical for personal growth and critical for effective teaching, and so what maybe are the macronutrients of the Christian faith? I'm going to put a few out there, and I think it's debatable, but here's what I would say. Macronutrients of the Christian doctrines, essentials, salvation, justification, adoption, uh, sanctification, right? If you don't recognize those words, they're um, theological, kind of like systematic theology words, but if you just think of, let's just take one justification, one macronutrient, justification. Um, we're going to say this is the protein of the spiritual diet, justification. Now, um, justification um, means something very, very specific, uh, and this is because of the everyday good news of the Bible, because of the everyday good news of the gospel, we are made right with God by faith. We are, that means we're justified. In front of God, we're justified by faith, right? And we are not justified by our performance. So we're not made right with God because we're doing good one week and then we're doing bad the next and now we're unjustified. Um, we're not winning God's favor, approval, and acceptance one week because we're really, you know, we're, we're hitting home runs spiritually, and then we have ourselves a real struggle for two months, and we're like, well, I really struggle with my, how, whether or not I'm right with God. That's justified by faith in Jesus alone. Well, um, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means, this is such good news, it means I, I no longer, I don't have to compete with other leaders for God's favor. I don't have to compete with other leaders for the favor of people because I am made right and in favor of God by faith alone. I don't have to do more to make sure that God um, favors me. I also don't have to compare myself with other believers or other leaders for val validation. I don't have to compete I don't have to compare. I also don't have to condemn myself when I fail to perform well. This is why this is justification by faith is so essential. When I fail, I say, well, listen, I am not condemned by God now any more than I am approved because I'm doing so well. So I don't have to condemn myself when I fail. And then lastly, I don't have to control everyone's opinions of me. God has expressed his opinion. By faith, I am seen as and adopted as his own son, and therefore, I don't have to try to impress God with my spirituality. I don't have to, um, of course, try to make sure that God sees me as perfect and that he um, looks at me and is impressed. So I'm trying to control his opinion or the people of the church. So, this means church leaders can lead and live with humility. Uh, church leaders can lead and live fearlessly. Church leaders can um, live with overwhelming gratitude, confidence before God, and with joy. This is justification. And of course, um, the distraction to the good news macrients, uh, macronutrients is the same as it is with our physical bodies. It's junk food. Junk food, spirituality, um, this is what Paul says. He says, don't waste time arguing over godless ideas. I picture it this way. Don't waste time eating godless ideas. Don't waste your time. And old wives' tales. So in the Greek and Roman culture, as you can imagine, there's all kinds of philosophies. One of the main philosophies is you can do it and the gods will help. Um, all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of humanism, all kinds of relativism, we'll, we'll mention that in a second, but um, it's important that a church leader is able to recognize a godless idea as junk food and say, I'm not going to spend time with that. I am not going to spend time with that teaching, talking about it in front of the church. I am not going to spend time digging into it on my own. I'm going to discern and reject false teaching 
even if it's just a version of the truth, I'm going to recognize that there's a danger of being sidetracked by myths and unprofitable debates. And these ideas are typically based on cultural beliefs, maybe anecdotal beliefs rather than reasoned or scriptural truth. So, you can imagine if it is just like junk food, um, which offers no nutritional value, even though it tastes good, it can harm your health. Just as teaching, just as um, entertaining these godless ideas begins to get kind of mixed up and stirred up among the church family, and we're handing books out of different authors with different versions of prayer and spirituality and angelology and so, uh, so many other ways. So one example of these godless ideas that could easily kind of pollute our nourishment together is this. It's, um, it wouldn't be called this, um, but you hear this. You would hear something like this. Um, save yourself to heal yourself. Or you can heal yourself to save yourself. And essentially, I mentioned it earlier, it's like the Home Depot motto. You can do it, we can help. Or in this case, you can do it and God can help. You know the gospel says? The, God's, the gospel says this. Because you couldn't do it, Jesus did it for you in your, in your place, on your behalf. Because you couldn't obey the law, because you couldn't die for your own sin, because you couldn't shed your own blood, Jesus did it for you. And God doesn't just help you save yourself and heal yourself. God does all the work and we, we receive it as a gift. And then we live our lives devoted to him, surrendered in worship out of gratitude and joy. We don't live for his approval, we live from his approval. Now this is just basic. When you hear something like you can do it, God can help, or when you hear save yourself to heal yourself or heal yourself to save yourself, basically that's humanism. And humanism is basically this. Humanism says all the power you need for healing and salvation is within yourself. All the power you need is within yourself. You just need someone to help you see it. You need someone to uh, come help you discover it. You need someone to help you stir it up. You need someone to come and help just kind of get you activated. But all the power you need is in yourself. Start by loving yourself. And we recognize, right? We recognize that you can be inspired. You can be motivated. We, we recognize that there is power in us to make changes. But... To save ourselves and heal ourselves, that power comes from outside of ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit that God brings transformation from the heart outward. And only God can do that. So, leaders have to focus on substantive gospel macro nutrients and avoid getting, up and getting caught up in speculation and divisive issues. One of the um, current speculative or divisive issues hitting the modern uh, evangelical church is relativism. Relativism is basically this. I mean, there's a lot of ways you could define it, but one aspect that shows up is this, that, that someone's lived experience, which we would call subjective truth, right? Someone's lived experience is more true and more authoritative than objective truth. In other words, your feelings have more authority than the facts. Your feelings about your experience and, and the way that you lived and, and what you have experienced in your life has more authority than facts, or some people would say um, the truth. So there's a clash between subjective truth and objective truth. And... Um, and it's seen, especially in maybe a, like a critical race theory, it's seen this way. It's seen that um, all contrary facts, like if you, if you say, I live this experience. This was my experience, and this experience is true. It's absolutely true. Nobody can change this. When somebody says, I'm going to come along, and I'm going to provide evidence, data, facts, scientifically or whatever else, and I am going to demonstrate to you that you may have perceived this, you may have lived this, and this is your subjective truth, but the data, the facts, the evidence says otherwise. Then a person says, 
that that data, evidence, facts, and science is oppression. It's, it's oppression. And that it's only being used to kind of erase or modify or to um, kind of like trample on someone's lived experience. And this is eating up the church um, in the American culture. It's eating up the church where someone says, well, here's objective truth. God gives it to us. And somebody says, I lived something different than that. And so this isn't true. This is how I feel about my life. And this is how I feel about the truth. And we recognize that a lot of love is listening to people and hearing people and understanding where they're coming from. But we also know that life change, transformation comes from bringing the truth to bear in my own heart and letting the truth bring freedom to me and healing to me and hope to me. So um, we prioritize sound doctrine and um, we're careful about godless ideas and old wives' tales. I mean, we, we mentioned this a few weeks ago. We don't have to spend much time with this, the idea that um, there's so many people over the years that have told us when Jesus is returning. And if you want to know when he's returning, just buy the book, nine ninety nine. Now it's going to be nineteen ninety nine. you know, inflation. And if you don't like it, come back again in 10 years and you can read my revised version, updated, the unabridged, updated version. And, you know, when you think about end times and charts and timing and whatever, I think, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time charting, planning, and talking about end times predictions with timeline charts because, I mean, one of the main reasons is because Jesus said no one will know the day or the hour, not the angels in heaven or the Son himself. And I'm kind of like, okay, well, that would be a lot of interesting conversation, teaching, right? But also, like, we're just wasting time. We're wasting time. Here's what we know. Paul says, Jesus is going to return. He's coming back soon. Redeem the time. It's going to be quick. Be ready. That's my eschatology. I like to tell people, my eschatology is the Apostle Paul's eschatology. And then see, like, you know, if that's true, it's hard to argue with that. Um, but we're essential, being discerning about what teachings and ideas. Secondly, really quick, church transformation plan. Church leaders who are training hard. Um, church leaders who are intentional about spiritual training. And so much of our time and attention and money is spent on physical training. Looking good and feeling good, right? Recipes, shopping, eating, and moving. Um, and I think that a lot of the reason is because it's on the surface. It's easily seen. It's visible. And then spiritual training is under the surface. It's unseen and undetected. So Paul would have to say, hey, don't just worry about the physical training that's on the surface where people can see, but also, as a leader, be devoted to training your heart, your soul, your spirit. Be devoted to training. Um, spiritual training is subtle, and it's under the surface. It's unnoticed and undetectable, but important, critical, vital. Here's what he says about it. Instead, train yourself, Timothy, to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Less physical training if it's replaced by spiritual training. And we see this parallel here that's given to us. Church leaders, transformed churches, has, have transformed leaders who are apprentices to Jesus, who are learning and growing and being trained by Jesus themselves. I like the idea that when I get a chance to teach and talk about the scripture, I get to do so from this perspective. You're a disciple, I'm a disciple. You're following Jesus, I'm following Jesus. You're being trained as an apprentice of Jesus, I'm being trained as an apprentice of Jesus. We are learning to do this apprenticing together. Um, if that's true, then church leaders have to prioritize time for reading, studying, growing on their own, getting alone to pray. Church leaders have to prioritize intentionally engaging in lifelong learning. Church leaders must invite and accept coaching and correction. The best, healthiest church leaders I know are engaged, highly engaged with coaching and correction. Recently, one of my colleagues uh, told me that they, uh, upon being invited in to a coaching program, 
It was a church health program and also a church leader health program. And the invitation uh, was extended, and uh, their response is it was a leader coaching program. And, and um, the church leader said to me, there's no way I would do that. There's no way that I would do that. You might call it a church health program, or you might call it a church leader health program. I call it judge my performance program. And I'm kind of like, wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be helpful? I mean, this reminds me of my dad. My dad said to me one time late in his life, he had so many ailments and so many things that really needed to be looked at and taken care of. And every now and then I would mention to him, I would say, Dad, what does your doctor say? And he goes, I don't know. Dad, why don't you know what your doctor says? I don't see him. Why don't you see him? And he would say, I don't go to the doctor for fear he'll tell me something's wrong. And I think to myself, that's brilliant. That's so brilliant, but also deadly, (laughs) right? So church leaders cannot give in to this idea that I don't go get coaching and correction for fear I might discover something's unhealthy or something's wrong. Church leaders are, um, as Paul calls it, training yourself to be godly, getting coaching and help and consultation, and Paul says everyone should accept it. So um, where do we get the power, and where do we get the perseverance to keep training? Where does that come from? Paul says this is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. Paul says, we continue on because of hope. We continue on because we see the finish line. I don't know if you got to see this um, Olympic race. Um, Pastor Yon mentioned the Olympics. I um, was fascinated by the 1,500 meter men's race. There is two um, favorites to win. And these favorites are rivals. They've been trash-talking, which you don't typically see. I don't think you typically see in the Olympics. They're trash-talking. They have videos about what they're going to do to the other and, and, you know, how they're going to embarrass the other person. So crazy. And so at the end of the... This is so wild. At the end of the race, these two runners are leading the pack. And then... um, I'm trying to think of his name. Can't think of his name. But I do know this. I know what he looks like. Hawker, right? What's his first name? What? Cole Hawker. Crushed it. So Cole Hawker, literally, I mean, he starts to kind of pass one of them, and he gets bumped a little, and he kind of like falls back, and you're like, well, that's the end of that. Nope. Next gear. Cole Hawker is racing the two world's greatest 1,500-meter runners, And he hits another gear, and he runs by them so wildly. This is what I thought for a second. Is that a spectator that's run on the the track? you got to watch it. He runs by. He's got a man bun bouncing behind him like this. He's way shorter. And you're like, that's a spectator. He's going to win the gold. Boom, blows right by him and wins. Like, that is so fun to watch and so fascinating to see. And I would imagine that this is true for all these runners they have a kick in the final leg because they see the finish line. And when you see that finish line, you say, there's hope. This is going to end. This is going to, eventually there's going to be a moment when we cross the finish line and all the work we did to prepare and run the race is worth it because we crossed the finish line. And one day, believers and church leaders are working hard and are training and are really throwing themselves into leading and loving people and here's why because they know that there's hope that one day jesus is going to say look at them in their eyes and with eternal sincerity say well done my good and faithful servant enter into your rest not because of how good you perform but because you trusted me and this finish line this finish line means you know what it means When you see the eternal reward, you say, everything that it cost me on the earth was worth it. All the work was worth it. And I imagine that Cole Hawker was like, it was worth it. What I did was worth it. Never being mentioned in the predictions of who's going to finish in the top whatever, it was worth it. And last, church leaders... The transformation plan is church leaders who are modeling progress. This is one part here that I wanted to make sure that you caught. 
church leaders are not supposed to be modeling perfection. It is unbiblical to expect church leaders to model perfection. And all of us believe that until we come across a church leader who's imperfect, and then we're like, I don't believe that anymore. How could this church leader be imperfect? Listen, church leaders who are preaching the gospel, here's what they're saying. That same gospel that saved you and forgives you and gives grace to you, it's also the same one that gives grace and changes me. And I'm trying to model for you throwing yourself into the grace of the gospel, and therefore I too will throw myself into the grace of the gospel. Church leaders are not supposed to be modeling peak performance. Instead, progress. Are church leaders growing? Are they the same person they were that you met 10 years ago when there's no maturity, there's no growth, it's the same old, same old? Here's what Paul says. He says, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young, he says to Timothy. By the way, commentators think Timothy was probably in his, uh, he's an elder at the church at Ephesus, probably in his late 20s, mid-30s. Um, most of the commentators favor that he's in his mid-30s. And how many of you think mid-30s is young? Raise your hand nice and high. There's a lot of you who are wishing you were 30 again, I can see. So how does Timothy prevent the church from looking down on him because he's young? How? How does he do it? The answer is his respectable lifestyle and character. Really quick, here's what he says. Be an example to all the believers, Timothy, in what you say and in the way you live. What you say and how you live. What you say, and it's veracity. The way you live matches what you say. If you say this is the truth, let it affect the way you live. And let those two things be together. Um, in your love, your faith, and your purity. And he goes on to say, until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. So here he is, young Timothy, and he's given instructions. Here's what I want you to do. Lead the church. How do I do that? I'm so young. That's all right. Live, practice what you preach, walk the talk, and also focus on reading the scriptures, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Give your complete attention to these matters. Remain hyper-focused on throwing yourself and watching yourself. And here's what he says. Here's what you um, need to do. He goes on to say, um, he's going to go on to say that you have to keep a close watch. Look at this. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Two things, how you're living and what you're teaching. Keep a close watch. Two things at the same time. I don't know about you, but one of the worst nightmares in my life is every day when I have to do more than one thing at a time. Worst nightmare. No ability to do two things at once. You know, the, one of the worst things that was ever invented and also the best was the GPS on my phone, right? Now I have to do two things at the same time. I got to drive, we just drove through um, major, um, major American cities on vacation. And I'm concentrating on my phone and I'm concentrating on everything that's happening in front of me, two things at the same time. This also showed itself when we were um, in rural Kentucky this week. And in rural Kentucky, um, I have to pay attention to my GPS, and I've got to pay attention to, of course, my dashboard, everything else that's going on around me. And while we're in rural Kentucky, my GPS, which is Google Maps, my Google Maps just starts to spin and spin and spin and spin. Got a, my whole family in the car, and we're going to a particular destination, but now we're in rural Kentucky, and I changed the direction so it didn't remember what was already in there. Now it's looking for it, but I don't have 5G because I'm in, did I mention this? I'm in rural Kentucky. They don't even have 2G. They don't have OG. And so, you know what's happening? I'm getting rerouted, and it's spinning, and it's rerouting, and then my wife goes, oh, my goodness. Did you not see the gas gauge? And I look at the gas gauge, and it is, ours goes like this, full, empty. And this is, my gas gauge is like, like this. My, my, when my wife sees this, she sees we've already run out of gas. When I see this, I go, well, let's see what the digital screen tells us. I was like, how many miles we have to go? Well, we're now at six miles. I mean, how fast does six miles go in rural 
Kentucky. I think it goes pretty fast. So I start thinking to myself, well, how am I supposed to pay attention to the Google Maps, to the whining children in the back who are hungry 24 hours a day? Just kidding. That, those days are over. And I'm supposed to somehow see my dashboard that, that it tells me that we needed gas 50 miles ago? And there is no difference. There is no difference in trying to watch two things at the same time to avert disaster. This is exactly what Paul is telling Timothy. Timothy, you're a leader. You're going to have to watch both. You can't focus in on your Google Maps and try to make your way here. How am I supposed to get there? And then ignore the gas gauge or the dashboard instruments. You have to notice the dashboard instruments, which reminds me. I told you this a while back, but if you're new, this is funny. You know how my dad used to deal with check engine? Black electrical tape. Put it right over. It goes along with his theory on seeing doctors, right? Because <laughs> if you can't see it, it's fixed. It's not broke. So Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, there's a couple things you got to do. Stop mostly concerning yourself with only what you say and what you teach. Watch your life. Because if you want to model progress, I want you to, I want you to know something. It's for the people. And the people are watching your life. And here's what they're asking themselves. Is this good news true? Is this real? Is this credible? Is, life, is heart transformation possible? Timothy, you're modeling it. You're demonstrating it. You're the one who is modeling what it looks like. Stop watching how other people live more closely than how you watch how you live. So here's what I want to invite you to do. Expect healthy church leaders to set the example. Set the example and be serious about growing, training, um, the essentials of the, doc, of the gospel, life transformation. Set the example. They don't set the example in perfection, but progress. In demonstrating what it looks like to humbly depend completely on the grace of Jesus. Church leaders, are they nourished by good news? Is that our main message among the church family? Um, are we careful not to get sucked into godless fads and meaningless speculation? Working hard at serving, leading, and loving the church? Is there noticeable transformation? Progress, not perfection. And then lastly, expect healthy church leaders to stay true to what is right. Stay true. There's so much temptation to absorb all the latest and greatest theological fads, the war of preferences, to engage in that war of preferences and traditions. Church leaders so easily get sucked into culture wars. What's at stake? How serious is staying true to what is right? Look what Paul says. Lastly, here's what Paul says. Check this out. What's at stake? Why are we staying true to what is right? Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation. Your own heart salvation is on the line. And the salvation of those who hear you. In other words, the people who are listening in the church, they depend, their salvation depends on st staying true to what is right. No matter what the fads are. No matter what the theological nuances of, 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 uh, of, of the current culture is. So discover what is right. Discover it. Salvation, by faith, in Jesus alone. Stay true to this. And, Paul says, if you do, you will be able to protect your credibility and you will be able to protect the salvation of those who are trusting you, who are listening to you, who are following your words and following your life. And we don't take that lightly here when we imagine church leaders who can set an example in transformation and progress, who are training hard, who are rooted and nourished in the gospel good news and flourishing in their own lives and hearts so that the church can follow in good faith. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for this time together. We pray that you would um, be at work. Help us sense where you're working in our hearts. Perhaps those who are emerging in church leadership perhaps those who have um, had 
some pain and heartache related to church leaders who were unhealthy or who were at a church that was stuck and um, did all kinds of other things beyond the transformation plan that you just laid out. And we pray today that you would help bring some health to our church family in what we envision, what we expect, who we are as church elders, leaders, pastors, deacons. And we pray that our church would be in progress of growing healthier as our roots go down into the love of Jesus. And what we picture, God, is not just a gospel-centered church, but a gospel-alive church. A church alive with the gospel, alive with joy and hope. And I'm praying for our church family, Father, that you would um, help bring healing, help bring health. We pray that as we say and envision gospel transformation for every heart, home, and neighborhood, that it wouldn't just be a saying, that we would be modeling it, living it, experiencing it, and telling the story of transformation. You're so good to us. We're so grateful to you. And we rejoice that you have allowed us this gift of salvation by faith in Jesus alone. And we celebrate that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing together in response to these truths.